on NPR when this, you know, when it was just starting. And um, I think they were featuring um, recipes for them. I, I, I think uh, I heard from that too. I've actually seen a, a gentleman near, I go swimming uh, pretty regularly because uh, I go by the pool. He's out in the morning collecting uh, cicadas off of bushes and trees in a large clear plastic bag. So I'm assuming there's some some uh, delicacy he's going to prepare. Yeah, I guess it's not just being a good guy and doing a, a, a good <laughs> deed. No, there's a motive there. Well, it's one o'clock now, so let's go ahead and get started so we can give Jay all of his time. Thank you very much for coming in this afternoon. This is the second in the series on backwards design. And our guest speaker again today is Jay McTai, uh, the author of, uh, co-author of Understanding by Design. So Jay, let me turn things over to you. Okay, thanks Susan, hello everyone. Hi. I enjoyed my time with you last week and hope it was of interest to you and I'm looking forward to our session today. So our time is short, so permit me to jump right in. Um, our first session looked at some, some ideas for framing courses. Um, and this session is really gonna focus on assessment evidence. Um, looking at different ways of thinking about assessment, collecting evidence of our various goals, and then a more pointed look at the question, how will we know students really understand important course material and are able to apply it? Um, and so that's a more focused question uh, for today. So here are the uh, questions that I, I'll use for this session. And so like we uh, did in our last session, um, I will periodically pause at least twice during our time together. Um, and you'll have a chance to be in meeting rooms uh, and just to share your ideas, summarize key points, describe how it applies to your teaching. And if there are questions that come up, you know, bring those up within your group if you, if you wish. Um, and there's an open invitation also to drop questions in the chat box. Um, and I'll be monitoring that um, along the way. So again, welcome. And um, let me jump right in, looking at my first question. This to me is an assessment question. And one of my favorite assessment cartoons is in three parts. So have a look. And so beyond the humor, the serious point in the cartoon, of course, is that assessment is a way we determine what students have learned. It's not so much what we have taught, and we can't assume that because we taught it, then therefore kids or students learned it. Um, it's really the purpose of assessment in part is to answer the question, what did they get from my teaching? What do they remember from my lecture? What do they understand from our coursework? So in the context of backward design, thinking about the evidence we need to answer these questions is really nested in part two or stage two of this three-stage model. And here is a kind of the mantra of backward design. My experience often is that people, teachers of all levels think that first they identify their goals, then they do their teaching, then they have an assessment at the end, and usually that's the basis for grades. But the logic of backward design says, let's not think about assessment as something we do at the end, 
let us think about it up front. And in fact, my experience is that it's one thing to identify a goal or a, or a skill or an understanding that you want students to, to acquire. It's another to answer the question and what will show or provide evidence that they know these things or understand uh, this, this concept. Um, I've written a lot about assessment in my career, and there are a couple of principles I just wanted to put forth here that I hope you know make sense and are understandable. The first is that assessment is basically an inferential process. By virtue of what students do on an assessment, be it a test, a quiz, a skill check, a project, a presentation, you know, written product, et cetera, et cetera that we look at what they do and we make inferences about what they know and, and understand. But our inferences are enhanced when we're working from multiple sources of evidence rather than a single source. I mean, this fundamental psychometric principle is typically noted in, in this case, one of the very definitions of assessment. Look at the, uh, at the statement here. This comes from a classic measurement textbook. And I love the idea that assessment should be thought of a process of synthesizing information to help us understand and describe. That evidence is plural. And so in a nutshell, our assessments and our ability to make sound inferences about student learning is enhanced when we have multiple sources of evidence. Now, this isn't a new idea. And I would hope that most of you during the course of your courses are collecting different kinds of evidence over time. As an amateur photographer, I'm drawn to this analogy. Think about assessment as photography, that any single assessment, including a final exam, a mid-session test or quiz, a skill check on some skill would be like a photograph in that it provides a moment in time picture. A more complete portrait uh, is obtained through a photo album. Multiple pictures taken over time um, is more revealing than any single picture within. This cartoon presents a related point. And I have a laugh, tra a laugh track here just for fun. Even though it's not, not that funny. But, but the point here should be uh, straightforward that there's no one best form of assessment. For many things we teach, a multiple choice test or objective test more generally is efficient, effective, objective, and we use it because it's good for assessing certain things. In other cases, however, some of our goals require more than a multiple choice test to give us the proper evidence to make the, the right evidence, uh, inferences. So that's an idea coupled with the, with a photo album analogy. Not only do we need multiple pictures, but we need different kinds of pictures because we have different goals. I'm sorry, this screen thing keeps popping up. So these are familiar forms of assessment that teachers and university um, instructors use. Um, and to me, these are the kinds of pictures that we would expect to see in an assessment photo album. And this aligns to this related principle that our assessments should match our goals, i.e. we should be collecting evidence appropriate to our goals. And you remember from our last session or previous session, that I proposed we can think about three interrelated but not identical goal types. So if I wanna see if students have acquired important factual information, objective tests and quizzes will show that. But my contention is when we wanna see evidence of understanding and transfer, we need some different kinds of pictures in our assessment photo album. Um, and that's a long way of saying multiple choice or more generally objective tests may be insufficient. So here's an analogy I'm fond of using. If you think of athletics, 
coaches have a playbook in many sports. The playbook contains drills, skills, uh, skill drills, as well as plays that the team uh, needs to run. And I'm, I'm sorry, this is, uh, keeps interrupting. And um, the coaches use the playbook to develop the skills and the knowledge uh, of the game. And we can assess if students know the plays with objective tests and we can check on their skills individually. But ultimately, the coach wants the players to play the game. And the game involves putting together knowledge and skills and strategy and teamwork and conditioning. They all come together in an authentic performance. And if you think about it, games and athletics are transfer performances, right? Every game is different and the players have to take everything they've learned in practice and put it forth on the field or on the court. So analogously, I like to think of they are the prerequisite skills and they're the knowledge that you need to play the game. And we can assess those using traditional tests and quizzes. But at some point, we want students to be able to play the game, to apply their learning in real, authentic situations. And that's where performance type assessments are needed. So it's not um, either or photo album, not snapshot, use a range of assessments that match our goals is the principle. So let me pause on this note and um, let's have our first meeting room opportunity for you to um, just share your initial thoughts to what I've said um, and, and share your own thoughts. Like what kinds of photos do you use in your course assessment photo album and what different methods do you use aligned to different course goals? Okay, and why don't we have six minutes for this uh, first breakout, Melissa.
Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. I think most people are back. Um, I have to tell you, I so enjoy the breakout rooms and meeting different people and, and having rich, interesting conversations. And I, I hope you uh, do as well. So I'm gonna press ahead since our time is, is short in this session. So let us um, consider the second question. Because I've written about understanding by design and I talked about deep learning and the idea that understanding and transfer are among our goals, this question then becomes important when we think about assessment. So I'd like to engage you for a few minutes in a little exercise that I hope you'll find interesting. And I'm gonna ask you to respond in the chat box um, as well. So the qu my question to you is, so when you think about the word understanding, what do you think about? When you look to see if your students understand what you've taught, what do you look for to indicate that they do? My colleague Grant Wiggins and I uh, propose a judicial analogy and here it is. Like the courts, we're gonna presume students are innocent of understanding until convicted but the question remains, what evidence will convict them? So here are the exercise questions that I'd like to put forth. So what is understanding? How do you think about it? If you wanted to see if a student really understood something, what, would you look, what do you look for? What are, the, what are the indicators? And what's the difference between a student who knows some things, maybe a lot, but doesn't really understand them versus a student who really understands? And those are questions I like to explore for a few minutes and through this exercise. Uh, if you were with us last time, you may recall my confession that when I took graduate statistics, I was memorizing the formula, memorizing definitions, didn't really have a deep understanding of what I was doing. And it wasn't until a couple of years later when I saw the concept map that it really kind of hit me what those courses were really about. Again, that may be a testament to my, uh, my limitations as a student, but in other words, I knew some things about statistics, but I didn't really have a deep conceptual understanding. When I do this exercise in live workshops, if we were in person and we had a little more time, I actually have a worksheet in the form of a T-chart and I ask people to think about someone who really understands what are the indicators versus someone who knows something but doesn't understand deeply. Um, so we don't have the time, nor do you have a worksheet, but I am going to ask you to kind of think about the left-hand column. And you can think about this in one of two ways. One way is, if you were to declare, here's one of the most important things I want students to understand in my course, then ask yourself, so what would a student who has that understanding be able to do? How would they show it? How would you know they understood it? So think about it in terms of something you teach that, you, that really is important to understand by the learner. But here's another way of thinking about it. Think about something that you yourself understand, even something unrelated to your profession. So it may be a hobby or an interest. So for instance, in my case, I'm an amateur photographer. I'm not a pro, but I think I have a pretty good understanding of photography. So how do I show that? How do other people know it? Well, there are ways in which I can kind of indicate that I know some things about photography. Um, and so that's another way you could think about the exercise. Think about something that you understand. So how would other people know you had that understanding or how do you show it? All right. So uh, I'm going to uh, ask everyone to think about this and just enter into the chat box. People are already doing it. Um, what are, what's one or more indicators of understanding? And after you've entered one or more comments, um, have a look at what others uh, have to say.
Wow, what a great list has uh, already emerged. Keep adding as you wish, uh, but if you've entered, just scroll through to see what your colleagues have uh, recorded. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for uh, participating. Keep adding if you have something you haven't already uh, noted. So let me share with you, when I do this exercise in person, and I've done this with hundreds of groups over the years, it's not surprising that there's a predictable set of indicators that people identify on the left side of the column, very similar to what we see on the chat, uh, in the chat box right now. So here is a pretty familiar set of verbs associated with indicators of understanding contrasted with those on the right side. So permit me just to summarize, which actually aligns very, very closely with what you see on the screen in the chat box. So many of you said that someone who understands, pardon me, can apply their learning not just recall or recognize or select the right answer from four alternatives, but they can actually use their learning in a realistic way. Moreover, it's a new situation, some novelty that shows they really understand because they can transfer. Another um, thing that would show uh, understanding, students can see and make connections among and between things. Um, students without understanding might take in information, but they don't think it connects or they don't see how it relates to what you have previously taught. But someone who understands sees and makes connections. Someone who understands can create something new. Or as Jerome Bruder said in a wonderful book title, go beyond the information given. Another example that many of you had in one way or the other, Someone who understands can explain things in their own words and in their own way. This is different than simply re repeating what was told verbatim. So they can synthesize and explain or go to the bottom and teach. If you really understand something, you can teach someone else. Um, a fifth one, interpret. To interpret literally means to make sense of or to make meaning from. So we ask students to show their understanding of text, what's the main idea and what's between the lines, to make sense of data. What if any pattern do we see in this data? Someone who understands cannot just give an answer, they can justify their answer. They can support their argument. They can provide reasons. Predict, uh, several of you noted that. Someone who understands particularly in a, in a situation where there are patterns, if they can make a sound prediction and justify it, that's an indication that they have discerned a pattern and are uh, able to extrapolate in a logical way. And all the way down at the bottom, troubleshoot. This to me is one of those great checks for understanding that you can use as a formative assessment in addition to an evaluative uh, kind of assessment. Troubleshoot. Give the students a flawed example, a common misconception, for instance, and see if they can, A, identify that there's an error, and even better, can they correct it? That's a quick check of understanding. If it's a skill or process, give them a, a, show them something where there's a flaw or a skill error, and once again, see if they can correct it. So these are the kinds of things that a student with understanding or a person with understanding can do. Whereas if all they have is some knowledge without understanding, they can do the things on the right side, but that won't necessarily convict them of understanding if they can't do the things on the left. So here are the implications of this little exercise for our assessments. Here's my contention. When and if we wanna see if students really understand material, we should include assessments that have two parts. 
some application where they have to apply their learning in some way using verbs such as these. And secondly, that they can explain it, support, justify, or teach it to someone else. If a student can apply their learning but can't explain it, or if they know something but can't apply it, I'm going to propose we can't be convinced that they really understand it. Now, I don't want to go out on a limb and say multiple choice format tests are incapable of assessing understanding. I think in some cases they can be. However, without the ability to explain or justify or show their reasoning, our inferences are based only on a selected answer. Our inferences could be misguided because we've seen it, right? Students can pick the right answer for savvy test taking, uh, recognition of, of one key piece of information or lucky guessing. And conversely, haven't we all seen occasions where a student who really understands material will outthink your intention, outthink your question and pick an answer that's actually with explanation quite sound, but superficially is wrong. Again, I don't wanna castigate multiple choice. And I think for many things, it's a great method, especially for those with large class numbers of students. You've got to have a, an assessment system that's efficient. But I will nonetheless put forth the concern that if all we have is a single right answer kind of test model and students aren't able to explain or there's no application, we may be assessing knowledge, but I'm not certain we're fully assessing understanding and transfer. So um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Now, I do not work at the university level, nor especially for those of you in the health sciences and nursing. So I apologize that I don't have examples in those realms, but I, I would like to show you a few examples of assessments that maybe are used at high school and could be used at college level that, that just make a few points. So permit me to show you a few of these, and then I'm gonna pause so we can have another conversation in meeting rooms. Here's an example of a performance task. Uh, and this could be in a, in a government class or a, a social issues class for, course, for example. It's based on a provocative question. And this task, as you can see, involves multiple steps. Research, exploring different positions on an issue, coming up with a position, formulating an argument, and communicating your argument in some form. So it's a multi-dimensional uh, performance task. But to me, what the student do, uh, does on a task like this would give us insights in their ability, especially to formulate arguments and to communicate effectively. Oops, let me uh, go to the next one. Here's an example from a literature course. This is uh, around the novel, The Catcher in the Rye. And it was a culminating performance task uh, developed by a high school teacher. And the focus, as I imagine you can Im infer, is really around character analysis and looking at this character, Holden Caulfield. In fact, the teacher set up the task by saying, look, this story is being told by Holden to a psychiatrist. He's in a mental hospital. That's the story. He's telling his story. And so your job as you read this book is to try to decide what, if anything, is wrong with Holden. Is Holden just a normal adolescent guy who's maybe gone a little little too far in some cases, or is this a deeply disturbed young man? Um, and the teacher presents that in the beginning of the novel to really focus the student's careful reading and, and um, analysis of, of the character and his behavior, his words, and his actions in various circumstances.
Here's a rather authentic task that experts are working on considering, uh, you know, during the pandemic. And an extension of this could easily be, are we likely to see a third wave in the US, especially given the Delta variant, uh, and especially in areas of the country with low vaccination rates? What's the pattern in other nations? What can we predict here? In the courses that involve any kind of research methodology, the natural assessment would be to have kids conduct a research investigation. Uh, and here is just one example. And I'm gonna end this set of examples with what I would describe as a short, but rather sweet performance assessment that, that can be done very quickly. The high school mathematics teacher that shared this example with me told me that he, he actually does this at the beginning of the quarter where um, mean, medium, mode are taught. And he told me that students' interest in understanding measures of central tendency went way up when uh, he announced that this is gonna be part of their final uh, unit exam. Um, and, and I love this because the best assessments to me not only give us evidence, but they're set in realistic, relevant settings that students see as purposeful and see the value in, in learning for them. So I wanted to give you those examples. Um, with, with your indulgence, permit me to go back to the first one I showed you and make just one more point, which I recognize will not apply in every course, but in some courses, imagine that if the course in which this assessment was used was focusing on research, argumentation, and communication. Then you could potentially give students some, some choice within, right? They might have a choice of issue. Maybe you present four contemporary issues, drone regulation being one, or maybe you let them propose an issue they'd like to research. Secondly, you potentially could give them choice of how they communicate it. Now it has to be manageable. You don't want 30 people doing 30 different things, but you might give them some choice. And thirdly, you could even give them a choice of audience. Are they making their argument for fellow students, for a policy board, for general public? So I mention that only to say that another variable in the mix is, is it appropriate to give students any voice and choice in the assessments you offer. And my experience is with performance type assessments, there often is that possibility. So as you can see, these are open-ended. There's typically not a single correct answer to the task. And accordingly, you could give students some voice and choice. So um, I wanted to share those ideas with you and let us um, adjourn for another meeting room for you to to share your thoughts about what you've heard and things that you've done along these lines. Okay, and we'll have a six minute meeting room time right now.
Hello. Hello. I suppose this is our group. <laughs> um, no, you should have been invited to join a group. Um, let me see where you were at. Hold on, hold on. Uh, let me let me let me add you. I'm gonna I'm gonna send you to room two. There's some great people in there. They'll love to have you, and you know them. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Jeanette, did you want to go to a room, or would you like to just hang out with us? Melissa, she might be in a room because she was also registered just by a phone number. I don't know if she changed her ID or not. I think I, I think so as well. I think that's what she meant by the I'm the phone, but I wasn't sure. So I think she's OK, too. Yeah, we've got another one. It says Matt's iPhone. I think it's Matt Walker because Matt Garber only has one T in Matt. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Well, it looks like everybody is where they should be. And I also gave Jay the ability to move around. So everyone should be okay. You are awesome. If only the internet would cooperate. I haven't seen any glitches. Okay, good. But I'm also watching the participant list. I think the oddest part of breakout rooms is watching slowly the number countdown. Yes, <laughs> especially, uh, especially for me because I'm trying to put them on my spreadsheet and then they all disappear. Oops. So people, they all screen shoot the but we have 49 people from the Canvas Design Program that are here today. Oh, nice. The other 12 are mentors. And I actually have two people that are listed both as a mentor and a participant. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I have to confirm if that's right or not. And all our mentors are here except for one. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to go back to mute. I had to check, make sure I was on mute. I was talking to my grand dog. That's always fun. Yeah, she's a she's hilarious. Her grandma spoils her, so my my, my daughter gives me so much grief. You're so weak, mom. I said only when it comes to Chloe. Thank you. I have a I have a Frenchie, and he brought an owl pellet to the bedroom last night. I thought, oh. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> All right, they're going to close in 52 seconds. All right. Make sure I don't miss anybody. I'm going back to mute.
Um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, once again, I, I so enjoyed being in a meeting room and I heard some wonderful ideas. Uh, the last one, uh, Jack was describing, he said, my, my role in teaching is I'm a brain surgeon. I'm probing the student's mind and, and in his case, using Socratic questions. Uh, I love that. Um, since our, our time is winding down, I did want to wrap up with something that's in the assessment arena, but, but rather something we do at the end to get a grade, you know, evaluative assessments. I wanted to just highlight other purposes for assessments and share a few ideas with you before we uh, wrap up. So here's my third question. How might we use assessments in ways that will enhance student learning, not just measure and evaluate it? And many of you, um, I know, use things that I've heard quite a few just in the, in the meeting room sessions, uh, examples. This might be of interest to you. Uh, the word assess is derived from Latin and the term is asidere. And the original meaning of this term means to sit beside. And I found this interesting because often today we talk about assessment. Um, you know, we think about high stakes tests and grades or accountability uh, pressures. And yet the root meaning is, is quite different. Asadari, to sit beside, to observe, to speak with, to listen to, to learn from. And, and this, I think, is, is one lovely connotation of the term. Over the course of my career, I've learned about and written about the fact that there are, in fact, really different types of assessments that we use in classrooms. And arguably, we could have three categories. The first people often call pre-assessments or sometimes diagnostic. And these are the kinds of assessments you might do at the beginning of a new course or even a program just to get a sense of where the students are. You know, a pretest is, is a perfect example of, of that. Because we know that new learning is built on a base of prior knowledge, it makes sense to try to find out what the students know or think they know early on. And so anything we do in the beginning just to find out knowledge and skill level is valuable because it helps us know what we're building on, or in some cases, we have to go back and, and correct some misconceptions that might exist. Then we have formative assessments, which to me are those ongoing checks that good teachers use all the way um, throughout their teaching. These are typically not graded because their purpose is non-evaluative. Their purpose is to inform. A formative assessment is meant to inform. Inform you as a teacher about how it's going, whether kids are really getting it or where the rough spots are, but also inform students. This is where teachers give feedback to students to help them improve. Um, and finally, we have evaluative assessments, which are the ones we use as a basis for grading. And again, ideally, our summative assessments would be appropriate aligned with our goals. So we're using methods that give us the ability to make proper inferences. So that's just different purposes for classroom assessments. My friend Rick Stingens has distinguished these in the black bars at the top as the first two assessments for learning. Their purpose is to enhance and inform teaching and give feedback to learners for the purpose of improving learning. Whereas the evaluative assessments are assessments of learning. We've taught you everything. We've given you opportunities to learn. Now we're gonna step back and see what you can do, and we're gonna evaluate. And there's a place for both. Let me share a few ideas that are more in the formative assessment realm uh, before we adjourn. And while I know many of you do these things routinely, I'm hoping you might get a few um, good ideas as well from this last segment. Um, here's an interesting note. Um, th the point on the screen is from a summary of research conducted at Harvard University. And here's what the researchers did. They met with uh, former students at Harvard. They interviewed them during a um, alumni weekend, kind of a, you know, a weekend comeback for the class of, you know, 86 or whatever it was. 
Um, and one of the research questions was, what was the most significant learning you had at Harvard, but it, more specifically, what were the methods the instructor used that made your learning so effective? In other words, they were looking for effective teaching and assessment practices. And this was one of the most widely noted points. And I'll just, forgive me for reading, but to, uh, just to emphasize, students overwhelmingly report that the single most important ingredient for making a course effective is getting rapid response on assignments and quizzes. They suggest that the professor should hand out an example of an excellent answer. Secondly, overwhelming majority are convinced that their best learning takes place when they have a chance to submit an early version of their work, get feedback and criticism, and then hand in a final revised version. I hope that this makes sense and would resonate with your experience as well. Now, for those of you that teach in large classes, lecture classes where you have 50 to 150 students, this is gonna be a, a seriously a challenge for sure. But two points that, that certainly are, are feasible, I think. One is as formative assessments, you can have students create something and you simply say to the group, I'm gonna sample from the 100 in my class. I'm not gonna read every one or review everyone. But sampling as a teacher will give you feedback and you'll begin to see patterns. If, if several students are, have the same misconception or making the same error, that's feedback that maybe this is something that needs revisiting. Another option is to let students review and give feedback to each other, albeit with your guidance. So you would give all the students a rubric or a set of criteria or some things to look for and let them give each other feedback because reviewing the work of other students can enhance one's own understanding, in other words. So um, anyway, I just thought this was interesting and I wanted to share it with you. Now, I have um, sent an article to Susan and I believe she sent it out or will post it for you. Let, let me scroll ahead to it and I'm gonna come back, Oops, sorry. Uh, Here's the article. It's one that I wrote recently called Eight Quick Checks for Understanding. Many of these, I believe, are in fact doable even in large lecture halls. And again, they're formative assessments. They're not for grading. They're to give you a picture of whether students are getting it. So let me show just a few quick ones that I've used over the years, and I bet some of you used. Sorry, here we go. So a simple thing is hand signals. That's the low tech version. Periodically you pause and say, okay, I want, I want to see how many of you think you can explain the concept of assimilation now. Put your thumb up if you really understand it can, and can explain it in your own words. Thumbs down if you know you can't. And if you're unsure, you can wiggle. Now, whether you're working with 10 kids or 150, you got everybody has to respond and you can check it. You say, if your thumb is up, I may call on you and ask you to explain for the whole group. So be confident. Um, this is a quick check. Now there's of course electronic ways of doing this with poll everywhere or cell phone apps where you can signal. Um, and uh, it's a quick check even in large lecture halls just to put, get a pulse of the students. A variation, if you want to go true false and do it as a, as a test, um, you can do it. And for me, as a pre-assessment at the beginning of a course or early on to check along the way, um, I like the true false method. So when I teach a workshop on rubrics, I sometimes use this. So let me show you five statements and you don't have to vote or put your thumb up or put anything in the chat, but just think about how would you respond? Do you think each statement is true or false? So here's the first one. Analytic rubrics provide more detailed rubric feedback than holistic rubrics. B, 
because I teach the difference between holistic and analytic rubrics, this is a quick check for me to see what people already know. Some people say that teachers shouldn't give rubrics to students. That's like answer, handing out the answer key before a test. Why would you do that? And I like to ask people to respond. Do you think that's, do you agree with that statement or not? Some people maintain that you shouldn't use a rubric for grading. So I like to see what people think about that. Here's a fourth one. An even numbered rubric scale, a four point or six point scale will help guard against the, the psychometric phenomena known as gravitation to the mean. And I ask people to respond, what they think that's correct or not. And the fifth statement, students can use rubrics to self-assess. What do you think about that? So again, this is just an example of something that I've used. And for those of you that like answers, analytic rubrics are more detailed and specific than holistic rubrics, which are fine for grading, but they don't give feedback. They just give a score. I think students should have the rubric in advance. Why should we keep from them what we're going to look for in grading their work? Of course, rubrics can be used for grading. They're evaluation tools. Uh, those of you in statistics know, uh, and from research on scoring and evaluation, whether it's in the Olympics or uh, in writing, an odd numbered scale, like a five point scale, you tend to get a lot of threes, <laughs> but an even numbered scale forces a sharper distinction and, and, and mitigates against a gravitation to the mean. And finally, of course, students can use rubrics for self-assessment. In fact, I recommend that one of our photos in our album should regularly be student self-assessments. And if you're using performance-based assessments, ask them how they think they did against your five criteria or your three traits in your rubric. Because ultimately we wanna develop students who can self-assess, not just wait for the teacher to tell them how they did. Uh, just one final quick one. This is a more sophisticated, but a useful um, check for understanding. Uh, and it's good if you can have a, you can do it in writing, but you could also do it as a discussion. Have students make an analogy. So assessment is like a chef sampling the meal while they cook because assessment gives us information along the way um, as opposed to waiting until the diners test the meal. So these are a few of the very specific, practical, and I think efficient checks for understanding that are in my article. So I, I hope you will um, enjoy that. So our, um, our time is about up. So rather than having another pause, you're welcome to stick around and chat if you wish. Um, I'm looking at the Uh, Jack's question about some efficient management tools and assessment techniques. Uh, some of them uh, quite literally are in that article that I just sent. Um, and those can be incorporated in many cases through Canvas or in a, an electronic or virtual medium. So thanks for your, uh, thanks for your question, Jack. I'm gonna wrap up, but um, if you are so inclined and have a few seconds left, I would love to hear reflection, and for you, what was one of the most interesting or useful ideas you got just from this session? Maybe things I suggested to you or things that you uh, heard from colleagues. And otherwise, I'm gonna turn this back to, I think, Susan for our uh, benediction. And thank you once again for joining today. Jay, thank you very much. That was a very interesting session and um, it was, Wonderful to anticipate being back in a face-to-face -face classroom for many of us and uh, using some of the techniques you mentioned. Uh, 
it, granted, many of them could be translated to online, but I'm looking forward to seeing them raise their hands and, and things like that. Um, yeah, thumbs up on that. So again, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Um, I will kind of leave the screen on if you have uh, anything you want to add. Yep, I'll stick around for a few minutes. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you in our final session uh, next week.